Καλημέρα σε όλους. Καλό μήνα. Ε, και ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που είστε κοντά μας. Ε, η συζήτηση θα διεξαχθεί στα αγγλικά, γιατί είναι η μητρική γλώσσα της Jude και δυστυχώ δεν ξέρει ελληνικά. Ε, οπότε θα το γυρίσω στα, στα αγγλικά τώρα. Uh, I just said we're going to have the discussion in English since your Greek is not up to par yet. <laughs> Uh, I am Elian Dripoulou. I am the managing director of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Cultural Center. Uh, I've been here for almost three years. Before that, I was with the Stavros Niarchos Foundation who built this wonderful place. And before that, I did banking, consulting. Most importantly, I'm the mother of Christiana and Athena, my two daughters. Christiana is actually here today. Um, and we're very excited to be hosting our first WOW in Athens. Uh, before I talk about why we're doing this in Athens, I would like to ask Jude to introduce herself and talk to us about the WOW Foundation, the WOW Movement, and what the WOW uh, Festival has been for the last 10 years in London. Thank okay, you, thank you, thank you. And it's incredibly exciting to have WOW in Athens, to have WOW in Greece. I suppose because all my life, I have known that Greece started the thinking around the idea of democratic inclusion. And although they might not have finished the job, nevertheless, that has always been very inspiring to me. Uh, I'm just going to stand up so you can see what I look like from the back, right? I'm quite small. Um, and I'll sit down again now. So um, I'm a theatre director by trade. And so I suppose, inevitably, that means that I'm a storyteller. I'm interested in stories. And when I was a small child, I was so excited by getting everybody together, uh, just as we are now, everybody together, to tell stories. Uh, but I noticed, even when I was small, that the boys would tell me what stories I could be in. So they would say, we're going to do cowboys and Indians, or we're going to do dragons and knights, we'd like to tie you up, and put you in a corner, and we'll come and rescue you. And so very early on, I understood that unless you told your story from your place in the world, other people would tell you what your story was, and particularly for girls. I was able to do a lot of things in my life that I wanted to do, as a theatre director. I come from a quite a or, very ordinary background. Um, but, you know, I came to run a place very like this, the South Bank Centre in London. Um, and that was an incredible thing for a girl from a city in the north with a family who weren't really particularly educated. But re even running a centre as huge and important as the South Bank Centre was in London, I noticed that my power couldn't change the stories that we were celebrating. We were nearly always celebrating male composers, male writers, uh, male musicians, uh, male artists. And, you know, I just want to say straight away, I do love men. One of the men I love is here. I have a, a son, I have a grandson. This is not about not loving men, but it is about the fact that if you don't love women equally to men as a structural love, as a structural idea of equality, then women will always be pushed off the table, their stories will be smaller, and if their stories are smaller, their rights are smaller. So I started to look at all the stories that women tell and realized that Often we tell them in separate spaces. So you'll tell a story about domestic violence over here. You tell a story about um, research on breast cancer over here. You tell a story about um, issues to do with uh, uh, body image over here. And as a storyteller, I thought, well, actually, no one story can explain to us how everything has been made smaller for us, tighter for us, more bounded for us. So to understand that together, we have to put all the stories out together. But also, I wanted to celebrate the fact that, you know, all of you as women will have been told at some time in your life, don't do that, you shouldn't do that, 
It's not appropriate to do that. Maybe not do that, or why are you doing that? I mean, always the not is a very strong point part of girls' and women's lives. And I wanted to say, everything is possible. Wow. I wanted to say, women and girls, despite being told they haven't the right, they do it anyway. And I'm not talking about something glib, like women are doing it for themselves as a simple subject, but it's very hard for women to do things, despite being told they shouldn't. So the courage of women I wanted to celebrate, the audacity, the bravery, the wit, and this is how we came up with this idea of wow. We can talk about the word feminism, but I wanted to go just to a space of celebration. So I started it as a festival because as a, as a director of creativity, I know what a festival is with food, with music, with marketplaces, something um, inclusive and relaxed. And I wanted to also say that in a festival, things will happen to you that you couldn't plan. You know, it's your time, you can choose, you go wherever you want, you'll meet people you didn't know, you might have romance, you might eat food you haven't tried. It's the experimental nature of a festival, mirrors the idea of the experiment we are doing now, which is what would the world look like if women were equal to men? Because we've never seen it, so we don't know. How would that feel? It's an experiment. So the festival, in my mind, was once to try it out. And that was the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day in the UK. I couldn't know that then somebody would say, we'd like to do this in Baltimore, we'd like to do this in Australia, we'd like to do this in Turkey, we'd like to do this in Bangladesh. And now, um, nearly 13 years later, we have festivals in many parts of the world. They're always created by women, like Ellie and her team, and they're always their own festival. But they have this same framework of um, many stories, equal stories, equal space, intergenerational. Anybody can come, men and women together, and, you know, optimistic, not naive, but optimistic that it is possible for progress to happen. So going back to the optimism of Greek democracy and the idea that everybody can count, obviously not women then, not men, not, not women, not slaves, not dogs, we know this, but... Nevertheless, the optimism that we can together sit together and make a different world, that is really what WOW is about. So. Thank you, Jude. So it's that optimism that brought us to the first WOW Athens. Um, this, this whole project started a year ago uh, when uh, Gabriela, Athena, and myself, and my daughter Christiana actually, uh, went to WOW London. And we saw our first WOW, and we thought this has to come to Athens, this has to come to the SNFCC. And the reason that felt like such a perfect fit, there were actually two reasons. One, the values. The values that the WOW Foundation and the WOW Festivals try to inspire us with. Values of inclusivity and open dialogue, um, and this is one of you know, the core values of the Stavrodnias Foundation Cultural Center. This is what it was created to be, a public space where we can have open dialogue and it can feel very inclusive to absolutely everyone. So that was the first perfect fit. And the second was, it's a festival. That's what we do here. We enjoy festivals. We understand the power of celebration and we understand the power of dialogue. So we wanted to bring that format to the SNFCC and while we were there in London, um, we all went up to Jude and Domino and, and Jude's team, and we asked them if we could do it in Athens. And we thought this would be a long process, and we'll have to sit down and have like 10 meetings and see what it would take and what the um, requirements are. And they were like, yeah, sure. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, their advice is that we might need a little bit more time than 12 months to pull this together, uh, but we did it. The whole team did it in, in 12 months. We have been working that long to, to bring it to life, and we're very excited to, do, to have our first festival here and have all of the components that we would hope for. You know, we have the talks, 
and the discussions, and we have ex exhibitions, and we have the music, and theater performance, and the marketplace. So we were able to, to bring most of the elements of the festival together, and we're very excited to, to start this today. And we started with the methodology that the WOW Foundation WOW Festival recommends, which is the thinkings. So as Jude mentioned, um, the WOW Festival is now a global uh, movement. And now we're part of this global movement. And there are many global issues that affect gender equality. However, there are also many local issues that affect gender equality. And we wanted to make sure that WOW Athens also addresses the issues that are relevant to Greece. So what we did is uh, last September, uh, we had three uh, thinkings, that's the name for the discussions, the sort of the open brainstorming discussions about what are the relevant um, gender equality issues um, for Greece. And women from all walks of life and all backgrounds joined the, the conversation to bring their personal opinion to the discussion, but also as representatives of women's organizations. And they talked about um, women's sexual health, they talked about motherhood, they talked about um, the gender equality in, in the workplace, whether it's at junior positions or as very, very senior leaders. Um, they talked about uh, beauty and stereotypes and what it means to be judged by your um, appearance. Uh, they talked about having a right to your own body, whatever that means, and making decisions for, for your own body. So all these topics um, were, uh, were captured. Uh, there were more than the 17 panels that we have um, set for this first uh, WOW. Um, we, have, uh, we are addressing many of these issues, but there were many issues that we weren't able to address just in one festival, which only makes it you know, evident that we will continue to do this. And we have decided that this will be an annual festival for the SNFCC. So every year we will have the opportunity to address different topics that we weren't able to address the previous year, to go more in depth, to have uh, speakers um, that are distinguished in their areas, and that, that is the, the plan uh, going forward. So Jude, you talked about um, optimism, and that's something that uh, the team has discussed a lot, and we all recognize that um, gender equality doesn't exist, and just as you tried to use your voice uh, as director of the South Bank Center, we felt it an obligation here to use our voice and our power to bring these issues to light. Um, even at the level that I am, I still experience sexism every day, and I'm saying that because I know it makes a difference. If I experience sexism in, with a privilege that I have, I can't imagine the sexism that other women uh, in other areas you know, of the community uh, that they're facing. So there's a lot to overcome and there's a lot to um, improve, but we have come a long way. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the global perspective, what you see is happening around the world um, regarding progress on, on gender equality. Okay, so I, I mentioned this word optimism and said one has to be careful with it because you know, the, there are many, many very difficult things happening over the world. And to say one is optimistic can sound like you're trying to kind of camouflage the realities, the terrible realities that are happening. Um, but I don't know how to find the stamina for the long, long journey that equality takes unless I can believe that it is possible to make fundamental change. Um, and when I travel the world globally uh, for doing, doing wows, I mean, let's take Pakistan, or actually let's take Nepal, because you probably don't know Nepal very well. But Nepal, where we do wows for the last seven years, because they're one of the newest uh, constitutions in the world, they have the most fantastic legal constitution. The rights are impeccable. So South Africa, if you ever read the South African constitution, it's amazing. They have some of the highest rape statistics in the world. Nepal, an even more powerful constitution, speaking of women's rights, everybody's rights, and yet the, 
the customs, the culture of oppression and separation is so embedded that actually the gap between the constitution and the reality for, for so many people is so extreme. And, and this is why you can see around the world that in every country, you have almost like a separation between people who are trying to address the legal systems. All legal systems have usually come out of theological systems, and theological systems have all been patriarchal. So the legal systems, generally speaking, do not favor women. They don't help women. And so there are lots of legal areas all over the world trying to shift that to give women more constitutional and legal rights. But at the same time, the customs, as we all experience, of our mums and dads, our grandmothers and our granddads, um, you know, the people in the, the village or the city or the town, all kind of going, ooh, not sure. That's often much more powerful uh, as, in terms of inner guilt, inner anxiety, inner misogyny, you might call it. So you'll have in places like uh, Iran, uh, who you'll hear later on from Leila, Fantastic examples, brilliantly educated women, committed men, some, uh, fantastic advances in thinking, brilliant scripture, brilliant writing, etc., etc. But then you'll also see the extremism of pushback. Um, and I think that the more global activism there is between people who believe in gender equality the more stamina we build. And that's what I, I see. So in Pakistan at the moment, where we have the wows for nine years now, um, you will have an ongoing buildup of committed men and women doing wows, finding the way that the, their language, their understanding, their, what you call, might call them, you know, consciousness building, it would be the old term, gives them a lot more material in which to argue their case. But I'm gonna to have to say that in the end, I don't think that equality is about proving things to people. Because I don't think logic actually is what makes people change. I think what makes people change is something inside that is not logical. So I'm gonna ask a question if that's okay, right? So. Hands up if you think that equality between gender equality, gender equity, is something that you believe in. Hands up if you believe in it. I think it's a skewed crowd. <laughs> okay, you are, I mean, I'll take it as read that you're here for this reason, okay. H hands up who believes it is possible. Okay, now I have a quick look around yourself, right? you'll see that a lot of people in this room do not think it's possible. And that is the problem. And it's not a criticism if you don't think it's possible, but it's extremely hard to get somewhere that you don't believe is ever gonna be got to. I mean, that's like setting off for somewhere thinking what doesn't really exist. So this issue of believing it's possible is difficult enough for people who want it to be possible but for people who don't really want it to be possible, they really can keep maintaining the idea that it's not even needed. It's not even useful, and actually sometimes it's quite dangerous. So what's happening globally is that the more confident girls and women are getting, the more people who didn't want it to happen are going, that's enough, that's enough now. And pushing back, and we can see, you know, Roe v. Wade being overturned. We can see penalties coming back into, obviously, the Taliban in Afghanistan is extreme. But all over the world, people are pushing back. And I'll just finish on this one, which is that they did um, a, a, an Ipso Mori poll recently, and they asked the question, do you think feminism or equal rights for women has gone far enough or too far? And most, the, and the, the majority of people who are saying it's going far enough is going up, and the majority of people who are saying it's going too far, even further up. And this is not amongst people from countries with a lot of oppression, it's from countries in, you know, democratic 
countries, and it's not older men, it's younger men. So that tells you something about the pushback and the anxiety around identity globally. So, you know, it's not going to be tomorrow that we get equal rights. It's going to be a while. Misogyny is about power. So it's, it's about relinquishing power, and I don't know any group that wants to relinquish power, and that's why you get all the, the pushback and, and the resistance. And yeah, and I was going to ask you, because you, know, you said that in your job, you know, even though you're powerful, and I think it's a good word to you, women, women are entitled to use the word power <laughs> and think, I can use my power well. Power doesn't always have to be used badly. But in your power, you still get confronted by sexism. Is that in your role or in the assumption that you wouldn't have that role? You know, what's the, where does the sexism lie for you? I, I, I would say both. So in, in many cases, um, I would be underestimated. Um, and that sh that's actually a very good position to be in in a negotiation. Mm -hmm. It usually works to my advantage. Um, and in other cases, it's just what we call, you know, those microaggressions that you're sitting in a meeting room and someone will need someone to take minutes and all the eyes will go to the woman, you know, like, who's going to take minutes today? The woman. Or who is going to bring coffee? Or who, you know, who is going to help with something? Who's going to care about the Christmas tree? Um, in all the caregiving activities, that caretaking activities that women are uh, expected to automatically uh, assume. So it's more about being a woman than in my position, but it's even in my position. So I'm, you know, I, I have a voice now, which I didn't have when I was much younger. Um, when I started my job, I didn't speak back the way I speak now. Now I, I'm not afraid of anything. So I think that comes with age, but also with, with power. So I, I've often found, as a woman, that you get doubly auditioned. Of course. You know, you, um, you, come, you present yourself as a woman with you know, power and authority, and then people want to check, first of all, that you have got the intellectual or practical knowledge necessary, but they also want to check that you haven't brought with you too much powerful baggage in your personality, you know, they want to know that you're still like a nice woman. Because if you're not a nice woman with power, then you're, you're a bad woman with power. And there's a name for that. What's, <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of names for that, yeah. <laughs> lots of names for that. And so you find yourself, you know, leading with your pleasing side, which is dangerous because also the symbolism of your pleasing side is that you're available, you're pliable, you know, you're maybe not so confident. It's, it's really difficult. I, um, I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, that this is a, an experience that every single person has, but in my experience, most girls, you know, they get T-shirts with on which, you know, she's sweet, what a cutie, et cetera, et cetera. And so you're, you're groomed. I use that word specifically. You're groomed to be good nice, kind, smiling. I mean, did you get... And, and to not r take risks. And to not take risks, I yeah. mean, boys can climb on trees, but girls have to not get their shoes dirty in the playground. And, and you know, I thought this was something we would grow out of, but I said I have a granddaughter who's nearly five, and I have a grandson who's nearly four, and the granddaughter already is being told in the playground that she doesn't, shouldn't do this, and she shouldn't do that, etc. And so... In actual fact, I feel as if we might be being more gendered now than maybe you so maybe in the in the sixties and seventies. It feels as if because there's certainly more commercial opportunity. You know, as as commerce has grown and grown, and the things you can sell to people have grown and grown. I think the gendering of the market to girls is driving a lot more of this thinking now. You know, we just had like a T-shirt. Now you have so many T-shirts with so many slogans on. And I don't remember when I was little the toys being pink and blue in that way. Do you? I mean, you're younger than me. Yeah, I remember that. Do you? Yeah. Okay, well, I don't think it's it, got worse, it, though. It, and still, in toy stores, you have um, toys for boys and toys I for know. girls. And girls get dolls and boys get Lego. So um, Exactly. Yeah. So my partner, who is still really a boy... Um, is, <laughs> has just bought a Baco set, you know, the building sets, 
It's a, a kind of an antique, almost like it's from the 1960s. And it says on it, for boys and girls, house building for boys and girls. And it's not blue or pink. But I don't think that's easy to get like these days, no. except maybe, it, because even Lego, they have girls Lego now, don't they? It's, um, you, you see progress and, I mean, you talked about the global trends. Um, we're a Western country, so we're expected to have gender equality. And to a great extent, there is legislation that protects that. And I'm saying to a great extent, not 100%, because there are still many legislative you know, measures that one can take to actually support it in practice, like childcare and things like that, which we still are behind in. And I'm certainly not an expert compared to representatives of women's organizations um, to talk extensively about this, but we, we see progress in Greece too, but we also see a lot of progress that still needs to be made. And going back to you know, optimism and pessimism, if I look at my parents and grandparents' uh, generation, I can see how far we've come. Uh, when I live in today, um, I, I feel a lot of resistance still, as, as you described. And what gives me optimism is um, the way my daughters react to, to all this. So they'll come back from school and they'll be livid about the fact that the gym teachers used the word, you should do girls push-ups, which is the easier ones for on your knees. Or um, the boys can go play soccer on a rainy day. They can go out in the rain and play soccer, but you need to stay in the closed gym. Uh, so things like- you get wet. But they're from sugar, I guess. Yeah, sugar, sugar, yeah, yeah. yeah. terrible. Um, so the fact that they notice, notice these things and talk to me about them, I think that's the key source of optimism. Because at their age, frankly, these things just went over my head. Sexism in advertisements that we would watch every day or all the you know, ch children's stories where all the princesses are saved by the yeah. strong prince. All these just went over my head. I didn't realize how sexist they were. And my girls pick up on everything. Well, I think that is great, and that's why I say, you know, I'm an inveterate optimist. But I also think that the, the circle of anxiety inside women is very strong, trying to fulfill expectations and defy them at the same time. And most women I know who are friends of mine carry exactly the same burden of anxiety about all the caring things that prove that we are loving at the same time as trying to do all the things that are about our life and aspirations and, and, and um, ambitions and dreams. And that carries on, you know, just as women without caring responsibilities. Once you add in children, if you want them and can have them, and then you add in, you know, all those other things as well. What I see at the moment is a lot of women um, carrying inside them inner criticism about so many things. Even though you've said, I don't agree that I should be rescued by a prince, and I don't agree that I should look like a Barbie doll, and I don't agree that I should have to do those things, you can't prevent that thing of, but, you know, maybe I ought to. And that's, I think, one of the, the, the things that's holding us back a lot. This is not a criticism of women, by the way. It's just an acknowledgement that I am still fighting battles in myself about trying to be both a rescuer all the time, you know, as well as a, an individual. And it's, it's a lot of work. It's true. I would like to open this up for questions. There is a microphone. If someone wants to ask Jude or myself any questions. Okay, hi, I'm Katerina, and I am a journalist for Hellenic Broadcaster Earth. And Jude, I'd like to ask you the following. I mean, speaking about gender equality, uh, we know that men also grow up thinking that they cannot cry, that they are strong, that they should also play uh, outside in the fields, okay? And then on the other hand, we are told that women or girls when they're young you know, they should be acting in a certain way. And these things are told by their mothers, okay, mostly. So my question to you is, 
is gender equality, what is gender equality at the end of the day? And is gender equality um, a game of the mind to start with? And secondly, if you think that we have to change women ourselves the way we think about ourselves, because we do tend to think of ourselves as weak and weaker. That's my question to you. Thank you. Okay, that's a big question, <laughs> but it's a great question. I mean, it's really the, you know, what, like most of this weekend is like taking big questions and nibbling at them to see how much you can find some of the way to the answer. Because there's something very mysterious still about the human. You know, and I'm not going to pretend that I know enough about the human and the human consciousness and human evolution in terms of where we might get to in understanding of gender. It's a journey. I don't think it's clear what the finish will be, but what you've, numbered, you've raised a few things. First of all, I think that boys and men are often strongly imprisoned inside gender norms, and it, it's cruel. I think boys, you know, raised to fight, but no longer needed for armies. They don't have to be so stoical. They could cry. They don't have to think that violence is the nearest thing to hand for strength. So there's lots of conversations, I think, that boys and men should need and must have about identity and masculinity. And I think these conversations need to begin. It can't all be done by women onto men. And then secondly, I think that the thing about mothers who, you know, let's face it, we do get blamed for everything. Um, I think it's really difficult because mothers are trying to do two things. They're trying to make their child survive in the best way possible in circumstances where most children want to be normal and the same and fit in. So you, like, you're positioning your boy to fit in. And at the same time, and your girl, at the same time, mothers know that maybe that's not so great. So I think there's a conflict. Um, it is, I mean, what you're already saying is there are lots of conflicts about these things, and I agree. There are lots of conflicts about these things. And the matriarchy inside a house of like saying, I want things to be the same, is that, that's part of a, a really problematic dynamic that a lot of girls end up fighting their mothers for independence when Actually, all along, the father can just stay back, be very nice, be, be the kind one. But in a way, you know, it still comes down to them. Other questions? Christiana? Hello. Um, so, my question is, do you think that part of the reason, like, gender inequality and sex se sexism is per perpetuated is because, like, older generations uh, have these sexist values, like, um, boys shouldn't cry and girls shouldn't, like, play in the dirt, uh, instilled in them, and they're, like, kind of passing them on to younger generations? Well, let me ask you, do you think that, first of all? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think each generation, on average, improves. Mm. And I've seen that improvement in society. Um, but I also see what you mentioned earlier, that younger men, younger boys are going back and saying this thing has gone too far and are fighting back. So I, I don't know that I have a straight answer. Well, I, I think that, you know, I did a journey, or I've done a journey a few times in India with lots and lots of young men and women for maybe two weeks, traveling around the whole of India, Indian uh, students, and looking at how to change social mobility across the board in India. And a lot of the girls are trainee doctors, trainee lawyers, you know, they've got fantastic uh, academic opportunities ahead of them. And at the end of the journey, I cannot tell you the number of girls, women, young women, who are crying and saying to me, I see all this, I could help, I could do, etc. But when I go back, I am going to have to make sure that 
I can do it, provided I also run the house, do the cooking, look after my parents-in-law, you know, they, in other words, do all the things that women do and do all the things that men do. And, and when you say, well, who's asking you to do this? They often will say the mother and the grandmother as much as they say my father. Because sometimes the fathers aren't even involved in discussing. They just expect something to happen. And I often say, well, you know, mothers are in a situation where they often fear that if you step outside the world that they were brought up in, two things will happen. You might fail. And maybe it says to them, the mother, well, your life wasn't very good then, was it? Your life was very important. And I think this is another dilemma about how does your life matter if what your children do suggests that your life was wrong? You know, how does that work emotionally? So when I, I'm one of four daughters, and when we grew up, we thought my mother was great because she cooked the dinner, she washed the dishes, she did the laundry, and she was always fantastic. And then we could talk to my dad about feminism. And I'm serious, like we thought my dad was so exciting and interesting because he loved feminism. And my mother would be doing the washing and making the Sunday dinner. And I never wanted to be like my mum, I wanted to be like my dad. And I just look back and think, my mum was so nice, because she never said to me, you little shit. <laughs> what about me? You know, she wanted us to have the liberty, but she wasn't trying to live that herself. And I think that we often, I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, but you know, it's a difficult one because you're trying to break into new territory and almost always that suggests that the people before you were doing something wrong. And that's not a good dynamic in, between people who love each other. So I think families can be the hardest place to create progress inside. And of course, between couples, you know, the tension. When a woman says, I want to know more about our bank account because I want to know more about money. Do you know what most men's attitude is? You think I don't look after you? You think I'm doing something wrong? Or are you gonna leave me? And you want to know how much money we've got? It's a really frightening discussion often between men and women, issues to do with money. And so the, the hardest place to make change, I think, is actually inside the family. And I think, you know, s some people say if the, if the mother is working, that creates a different sort of model. But I think whatever is happening in the family, the most important part is for it to be by choice. So if the mother chooses or the father chooses to stay at home, that it's by choice and not because of, you know, stereotypes. I grew up in a family where both, both parents worked. And what did you feel about that? Fine. I mean, I never had that... Um, I, I never had the uh, feeling that, oh, my mother was away and not taking care of me. It seemed very natural. And very do you, natural. did you talk to your mother about feminism? No. <laughs> Why not? I didn't know it was a thing. And I, to be honest, I never felt constrained. Uh -huh. um, so it never occurred to me as a young child that I have different opportunities than boys. And so when did you find out you didn't have the same opportunities? <laughs> what, when did the glass ceiling go boom? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Um, I think when I came, I, I worked in the States after my uh, graduate degree, and then I came back to Athens to find a job, and I had an MBA from one of the best universities in the world. I had already worked in banking for a few years in consulting, and I started interviewing with companies in Athens multinational, like the typical, you know, FMCG or banks or whatever, and I was 30-something and fairly recently married at the time, and I went into interviews, and there were no uh, qualms about asking me exactly when I'm going to have my kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's when I walked out, basically, from the interview. I, I, I just couldn't fathom the question in one company, a very well-known company, a uh, multinational company, they even asked me what religion I am and what job my parents have. So that was the first time I, I felt, you know, that why does it matter when I'm going to have kids? Mm -hmm. 
You know, how many, so, oh, you're newly married, yeah, how many years have you been married? Three. It's like ding, 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 red flags everywhere, three years married. And how much uh -uh. sex do you have? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, when are you going to have you your kids you tonight? <laughs> yeah, so the, I think that's when it really hit me, when mm -hmm. I came back from the States, 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Hi. I'm Caterina Cascagnotti. I'm a film producer, mother of two boys, and president of uh, With the GR, which is the Women in Film and Television, actually cooperating uh, with uh, some of the uh, let's say, um, exhibitions during the, the festival. So my question to you, Jude, is, um, first of all, you're very inspirational and thank you very much for, for all, let's say, all things you, you've said already. But I was wondering, during all these years and during all these festivals you've um, initiated and run in various countries, which was the uh, form of art that actually had a significant impact in the society. Um, and the message went through, you know, um, with uh, as strong as possible. If, if you had to name one, which <laughs> that would be? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Uh, the idea of which art form, like, gets nearest to the heart and the soul of the idea. I, I honestly can't say one more than another. I can give you some amazing examples. Well, actually, I think the Gorilla Girls exhibition here is a great example of the combination of, of wit and defiance um, that people will understand. I mean, making people laugh is a great thing. You know, it's really important for people to understand that women have got a sense of humor, despite everything. <laughs> we do have a sense still. of humor. Still. Still. So I think that... Um, that wit is a very important thing. In Brazil, um, we did the first WOW, I think six years ago, was it? And um, it was actually when Bolsonaro had just been elected. And it was a very difficult, polarized time in Brazil because Bolsonaro, whatever your politics is, you know, Bolsonaro also carried with him all the evangelical movement which was very, very anti a lot of women's rights. And so it was a very, uh, and also very um, anti-ecology uh, uh, issues. So the, the WOW had 92,000 people came. Can you imagine that over, over four days? 92,000, it was incredible. And it was run by the women of the favelas, which are the kind of very poor kind of, I don't know what, if there's a word for it in Greek, but you know, like kind of ghetto areas. And we had, um, they brought one of the singers who, she's just died actually a couple of years ago. She was like in her 80s and she'd been singing protest songs like all her life. She was an indigenous woman. And watching everybody listening to her song about human freedom from a woman who had been singing those songs since she was in her 20s, and there she was in her 80s, still singing these songs and still being a singer. I think that was incredibly powerful because people felt they joined her journey even though they were much younger than her. And that kind of idea of art which you join in on, on something, that I think has been one of the most powerful things I've seen. So, I mean, there are so many examples I could give you. I couldn't say that music's more important than dance or painting is more important than... But what I can say is that every single... Even though art says it's about truth, the artistic framing of, you know, who's important and who's not important is exactly the same as every other institution. So the criticism of art is, is that... It's hard for women's voices to break through, and it has been difficult. So whenever you see a brilliant woman, whether it be a rapper or a choreographer, you just think, we've been doing that for thousands of years, but finally it's being noticed. Thank you, Jude. We, we have to wrap up because we have another session, actually two sessions following this one. And even though it's our introductory session, uh, since it's the one where I, I'm here, uh, I would like to thank the many people that 
allowed us to put this festival together. Uh, and I have the names here because I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, first of all, Jude, thank you for your partnership and, and friendship. <laughs> Jude, Jude and her team, uh, Domino Pateman, Catherine Fenton, and Charlie Marshall, they have been our partners in crime this whole period while we're designing this. We've had weekly calls with them. Uh, I would like to thank the 63 speakers and facilitators who will be uh, participating in, in the, the three days of the WOW Festival, all the women uh, in the marketplace, uh, all the women th that participated in our thinkings back in uh, September and gave us sort of the content um, and the ideas for this uh, festival. I would like to thank our sponsors, Alpha Bank and Google, who were so quick in their response to support us because it's our first festival. There were many things up in the air. People didn't know exactly what we were doing and they placed their, their trust in us. And of course, uh, the British Council and the British Embassy with which, uh, whose support has been critical in, in preparing this, um, this festival um, coming you know, from the UK, originating from the UK. Uh, for today's... Um, event, I would like to thank our production company, Viewmaster Events. Uh, one thing I would like to share is um, when we went to uh, WOW London, we saw that most of the production staff were women. And again, it's one of those areas uh, of employment where you have, it's mostly uh, male dominated. And uh, when we issued the RFP for this event, we actually said we would use the percentage of women working on, the, on this particular festival as a criteria for selection. And our longtime partner, Viewmaster, came up with many talented women to, to help us with this, this event. And I will also like to thank um, Efi Psaradeli, who is our interpreter uh, for Greek Sign Language, our interpreters to Greek, uh, Victoria Tzolka and Christina Xanthopoulou. And of course, I would like to thank my team. Uh, there is no department of the SNFCC that did not contribute to this uh, festival. Our programming, marketing, visitor experience and development teams have lived their festival on top of everything else that they've been doing for the last few months, but all the other departments have also contributed. Uh, and departments we generally don't think about when we think about festivals, legal, commercial operations, ICT, security, HR, our facility managers, of course, who put all the marketplace together, facility management team. Uh, but there has been a core team that has been meeting for a whole year, and that is uh, Gabriela Triadafili, Athena Balopoulou, Christina Vasiliku, Evi Kesari, and Danai Panagiotopoulou. And of course, two women who came on board just for the WOW Festival, which is Jara Hrisikopoulou and Eli Gardiki. Uh, everyone at the SNFC, I'm re really grateful that uh, you made this project so personal and that we are starting off really strong for our three-day uh, three festival. Thank you.